Welcome back. U.S. Homeland Security Secretary Janet Napolitano was grilled today by senators on Capitol Hill, made to answer for the sex scandal that's rocking the U.S. Secret Service. Napolitano promised a, quote, complete and thorough investigation of the allegations involving a group of agents and Colombian prostitutes and called the incident inexcusable. But she stopped short of saying that it endangered the president's life. The first question I posed to the director was, was there any breach to the president's security in this instance? And the answer was no. Napolitano went on to say that a review of Secret Service records over the last couple of years showed no warning signs of problems in the agency and that no stone will be left unturned in the investigation. The scandal erupted earlier this month when a fight over payment between a Secret Service employee and a Colombian prostitute spilled out into the hallway of a hotel in Cartagena just before Barack Obama arrived there for the Summit of the Americas. Twelve officers were implicated. So far, eight have been forced out and one has been stripped of his security clearance. Today, Janet Napolitano vowed not to allow the actions of a few tarnish the reputations of the rest of the Secret Service or its legacy. So just what does this do to that agency and what goes on on the inside? Jeffrey Robinson is good friends with Joseph Petro, who is in charge of the Secret Service's presidential protection division during the Reagan years. And together they wrote a book called Standing Next to History, an agent's life inside the Secret Service. And Jeffrey Robinson, as you can see, joins me now from New York. Good to see you, Mr. Robinson. Nice to see you. Does this scandal tell us anything about the culture uh, inside the Secret Service? Yes, and I'll tell you how you can tell about the culture, by the fury of the other agents. Mm. This tells you this was an anomaly because everybody is so seriously annoyed about these 11, as the president called them, knuckleheads, mm. I have another term, uh, for doing this. I mean, these agents... And these officers, some of them uniformed officers, uh, and the uniformed guys handle the dogs and handle uh, uh, the metal detectors. They know how they're supposed to behave, and they understand what they're supposed to be doing, and none of it has anything to do with what they were doing. The rest of the Secret Service is furious. Because the reputation could be tarnished by what just a few guys happen to do. Yeah, you know what? The Secret Service, are, they, these, they really are the best and the brightest. Uh, I don't know of any other American U.S. law enforcement operation that has the pride that the Secret Service does. Uh, you see it frequently with the U.S. Marines. But the U.S. Secret Service is special. It's, it's a dedication to service that is, is phenomenal. It is a, no, a, a huge amount of personal sacrifice. These are men and women who who miss birthdays and, and first steps mm. and first words and graduations and little league games. And it is this pride. And when these knuckleheads do what they did to tarnish that pride, it annoys everybody because they are, they are the best and the brightest and this is not supposed to happen. So here, here's what I don't get. It's the secret service. They're supposed to be secret and at least <laughs> discreet. And that wasn't the case here. You'd think that they, if they were going to do this, could have been a little bit more discreet. Well, uh, just a very brief history. The Secret Service was formed in 1865 by President Lincoln, not to, def uh, to protect the president, but to protect the currency. They were part of the Treasury. And in fact, the legislation was on his desk the night he was killed at uh, Ford Theater. They didn't protect the president until after McKinley in 1901-1902. And they take this very seriously. The Secret Service mm -hmm. uh, will tell you our job is to make sure everybody gets home safe at night. Uh, so that anything that even remotely jeopardizes that mission or confuses that mission and gets in the way of that mission is just not accepted. Now, uh, Janet Napolitano is qu quite correct. I mean, I've spoken to agents. At no point was the president's uh, security in jeopardy at all. This was just 11 jerks who mixed testosterone with alcohol and threw in a little bit of hubris, and it's a pretty awful cocktail. Let, let's talk about what it takes to get into the Secret Service, because I was reading today, you know, it, it's like getting into Harvard. It, it's hard. It's not anybody can, <laughs> can get this job. It's, it's a very tough road to hoe. You, uh, you apply out after university. They want university graduates. They like athletes. Uh, in mm. the male agents, they like football players, because football players know how to play on a, on a team, and they know formations. Uh, women, they... Uh, who do the exact same job, and there's no special special uh, uh, dispensation for women. Hmm. They have to pass the same physical tests and do the same job. They like soccer players. So uh, you spend four or five years as an investigator, a treasury investigator, looking at counterfeiting and, and things like that in field offices. And if you then want to go into presidential protection or vice presidential protection, you go through a rigorous process. Uh, 
and it's years before they let you stand next to the president. So this, these weren't the guys, though, that go around beside the president no. and run beside his car at all. These guys were doing reconnaissance on the ground, or? Well, they were, they were there as support to the team on the ground, uh, and they were not at all involved with presidential protection, although operationally they are assigned to the presidential mm -hmm. protection team because they are ultimately in charge of the president's visit. But they were doing things like sweeping the rooms with the dogs and, um, and there to help support uh, uh, perhaps the, the standing post around the hotel. And, uh, you know, they have to protect the, uh, the plane, they have to protect the cars, they've got to protect... Yeah. Uh, radio equipment, stuff like that. But, but they I, were not directly involved with the president. But I have heard that once it's wheels up for the president, it's uh, <laughs> parties on for these guys. So that, that, is, that, is that true? Well, come on. Now, what's the difference between, <laughs> you know, the, the, the mission is accomplished, and if you are the Secret Service and you've had a, a rough, really stressful four or five days protecting the president, or you're the, I don't know, Toronto Maple Leafs, and you've just won the you know, Stanley Cup, uh, there's no difference. You party. Uh, <laughs> That happens. Well, They're not supposed to party before they win the Stanley Cup. Yeah, w one of them carry guns and the other one doesn't. But uh, do you? Do you ah, yes. Well, these agents, these agents did not have guns. Their right. guns were not involved. They were not permitted to carry guns outside of the United States. So that's uh, that's okay. one thing less. Okay. So, but would it, is any of this going to change the rules, or is this really just a one-off? Is anything going to change out of this? Well, it is a one-off, and what it will change is that if it ever happens again, it will not happen very soon. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. Jeffrey Robinson, thanks for your perspective and your insight. A pleasure, anytime. This isn't the first scandal that Secret Service Director Mark Sullivan has had to answer for. You may remember this couple. Three years ago, they made their way past Secret Service agents and crashed a White House state dinner, even mingling with the Obamas. Sullivan was called to testify at a Homeland Security Committee to explain the security breach. As for the agents who let the party crashers through the gate, they were both placed on administrative leave.